to the annual State of the Judiciary Address. I'm Tom Bond, president of the Massachusetts Bar Association. I would love to be doing this with you live and in person and afterwards shake hands, have crackers and crudite, and maybe even a libation. But we live in a different world now, a world of Zoom conferences, electronic information, wireless internet. Our courts need to adapt to this change world and come into the 21st century. To that end, the MBA focus this year is on working with the courts and with the legislature in getting House Bill 1520 passed. The bill seeks bond funding for electronic filing, case management, wireless internet in the courts. Now just imagine, there you are, you file a case electronically easily in every county in the Commonwealth. Or you walk into court and while waiting for a case to be heard, you can actually get some work done on the wireless internet. And your juries can get some work done on the internet while we're asking them to wait in the court. We are meeting next month with all of the county bar association presidents and with the chief information officer of the trial court to talk about the tech needs of each county and how to work together to get this bill passed. Now, it's not only tech needs that the court has, this bill also addresses the capital needs of the courthouses throughout the Commonwealth. Many of our older courts are crumbling and we need to bring them up to the standards of courthouses everywhere in this Commonwealth. The Massachusetts Bar Association agenda this year is people, programs, and pipelines. We will work with diverse students and lawyers, offer programs to create a pipeline for careers in the law, or future judgeships. Let me tell you about a couple of these programs. The first is a mentoring program. We believe it's important to have mentors who share the identities of diverse students. So what we've done is, and we do this in Boston and in Worcester, we group a diverse high school student with an undergrad, with a law student, and with a practicing lawyer, and we introduce them to careers in the courts and in the law. And the programs we've done in the past have included such luminaries as Ianna Presley, Rachel Rollins, Chief Justice Budd, uh, the Worcester County Sheriff's Department. In addition to that program, we have a Leadership Academy program where we take young lawyers practicing less than 10 years from uh, diverse backgrounds and we teach them trial skills to enter the judicial ranks. Now, right after this program at 5.30, we are meeting with four superior court judges from the court's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. And they're meeting with all five MBA leadership officers and the MBA's Diversity Committee. And we're gonna discuss a possible judicial mentoring program for diverse lawyers. In closing, we at the Massachusetts Bar Association will continue to work with the bench, with the bar, and with the legislature to make our courthouses safe and accessible for all individuals, no matter who you are, where you are from, or where you practice. I promise. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce the leader of our judicial branch, Massachusetts SJC Chief Justice Kimberly S. Budd. I am honored she will be delivering her first State of the Judiciary Address since being elevated to the Supreme Judicial Court by Governor Charlie Baker in October of 2020. She is the first Black woman in the history of the Commonwealth to serve as Chief Justice. Throughout her career, she has been a trailblazer with a wide range of legal experience. She started as a law clerk to Chief Justice Warner of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. She's worked in the private sector as an associate at Mins Levin. From there, she switched to the public sector and worked as a U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Boston. She's worked in academia. She's been the Director of Community Values at Harvard Business School, Professor of Trial Advocacy at Harvard and New England Law School, Boston. In the judiciary, she started as a Superior Court Judge she did that for four years before becoming the Regional Administrative Justice at Middlesex Superior Court. 
From there, she went to the Supreme Judicial Court where she was a justice for four years. She served on the committees for pro bono legal services, trial court leadership, and judicial performance evaluation. Since taking the reins and becoming Chief Justice of our highest court, she's worked to address the fact that Black and Latinx people get incarcerated at a much higher rate and receive far longer sentences than white people. Under her leadership, working to address the many issues raised by the SJC Wellbeing Committees when they had their town hall meetings with Asian, Black, Black women, Hispanic, and LGBTQ people, she's continued to work with them to try and address the issues faced by these communities. We at the Massachusetts Bar Association look forward to working closely with Chief Justice Bud this year on these and other issues. And we look forward to hearing her address today. So please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Kimberly S. Bud. Thank you, President Bond, for your kind introduction. I also want to thank you and the Massachusetts Bar Association and your Chief Legal Counsel and Chief Operating Officer Marty Healy for sponsoring our program today. And thanks to all of you in the audience who have joined us for this event. It's a privilege for me to have this opportunity to speak with you, even if only virtually. It seems unreal that we are well into month 20 of this pandemic. Who would have imagined when the first cases of COVID-19 began to appear that we still would be battling multiple waves of infections after all this time. Sadly, hundreds of thousands of people in the Commonwealth have fallen ill and thousands have died. Many others have lost loved ones or jobs. And even for those whom it has not touched so directly, COVID has created unprecedented disruptions in our family routines. For our courts, the health and safety restrictions required by the pandemic forced us to make huge changes in how we conduct business to minimize in-person contacts. Hearings were often held by video conference or telephone. Paper filings were largely replaced with electronic filings. And emergency orders were issued to accommodate the needs of litigants and lawyers affected by the pandemic. And in the midst of dealing with all of these issues, we suffered a devastating blow with the death of our chief, Chief Justice Ralph Gantz in September, 2020. It was for that reason that we did not hold a state of, judici of the judiciary event last year. For those of us at the SJC, the death of Chief Justice, Justice Gantz came as a great shock, not only because it was so un unexpected, but because he was such a huge presence in our daily lives. He was always in touch by phone or email or showing up in person, offering encouragement, seeking our advice or sharing his own, almost always leavened with his self-deprecating humor. His wisdom, energy and can-do spirit buoyed us all during a dark time. For me personally, he was a great mentor and friend and I still find it hard to grasp that he is not just down the hall or a phone call away. But even though I can't ask him for advice anymore, I can still look to things that Chief Justice Gantz said or wrote or did, as I now endeavor to do the job that he did so well. In fact, a passage from the very last State of the Judiciary address that he gave inspired my remarks today. At the, at the outset of that address, Chief Justice Gantz said, if we bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice, one case at a time, we do so because a wise and patient judge presides over a courtroom that is well organized by an experienced clerk that is kept calm and safe by a savvy and good humored court officer that is supported by probation officers who care deeply about the success of the persons under their supervision and the safety of the public that sits in a courthouse that is kept functional and clean, often despite its old age and deteriorating condition by a committed facility staff. Chief Justice Gantt recognized that just justice is a team effort. He knew 
we can only attain our lofty ideals about how our courts should function through the collective contributions of everyone in the court system. I would like to extend my deepest thanks to the more than 6,000 employees of our court system for all that you've done to help us weather the many challenges of COVID-19. You have demonstrated remarkable resilience, ingenuity, flexibility, and teamwork as you have overcome so many obstacles to keep our courts operating and accessible during this difficult period. Judges and clerks have had to master new technologies and learn how to conduct court proceedings by way of Zoom. Probation officers have similarly had to hold many of their check-ins remotely. And court officers and facility staff have added compliance with health and safety protocols to their list of duties. Our IT staff, led by the late Craig Burlingame, another sad loss in our court family, and more recently by our new CIO, Steve Duncan, and our deputy CIO, Jeff Travers, have worked tire tirelessly to shift court operations online and to expand the infrastructure needed to support that shift. The members of the Jury Management Advisory Committee led until her retirement by former Chief Justice Judy Fabricant, have devoted many hours to researching the safest ways to conduct jury trials. The recommendations in the committee's reports to the justices have been adopted by the court and implemented by Jury Commissioner Pam Wolf and her staff. Thanks to their work, we've been able to resume jury trials in all the courts that ordinarily conduct them. In fact, I recently appeared for jury duty and had a firsthand look at the process. All of the court personnel, court officers, assistant clerks, and judges made it work seamlessly. Appeals Court Chief Justice Mark Green, Trial Court Chief Justice Paula Carey, former court administrator John Williams, and new court administrator John Bayo, Probation Commissioner Ed Dolan, and the Trial Court's Department Chiefs, Deputy Court Administrators, Regional Administrative Justices and First Justices, Clerks, Registers, the Recorder, and their staffs have all managed countless changes in court operations. In particular, I want to commend Chief Justice Carey, not only for her extraordinary leadership in shepherding the trial court through the pandemic, but for making time to carry on several important projects that Chief Justice Gantz launched before his death including the, the eviction diversion initiative, which you'll hear more about from Chief Carey. She, along with Chief Justice Tim Timothy Sullivan of the Housing Court, Chief Ju Justice Paul Dolly of the District Court, and Chief Justice Roberto Malchio of the Boston Municipal Court, have worked in partnership with executive branch leaders to make it easier for tenants and landlords to access financial and legal assistance and stabilize tenancies. Thanks to their collective efforts, along with safeguards enacted by the legislature, Massachusetts has largely avoided the wave of eviction cases that we once feared. As you know, Chief Justice Carey recently announced her intention to retire in January after two decades of dedicated public service as a judge in the probate and family court, as chief of that department, and as Chief Justice of the Trial Court. She's made enormous contributions to improving our court system and we will deeply miss her passion and energy. It's sometimes hard to imagine someone caring more about our court system. Thank you, Paula, for all that you've done for the court system and the Commonwealth. I'd also like to express my heartfelt appreciation to my colleagues on the SJC for everything they have done to meet the many challenges facing us during, during this tumultuous time. Since March of 2020, our court has promulgated orders modifying court operations and legal practice in response to the changing conditions created by COVID-19. And we've issued numerous opinions deciding difficult questions arising out of the pandemic. After Chief Justice Gantz died, Justice pa Barbara Lank generously stepped up to lead the SJC until his successor was appointed. She did so even though she was only weeks away from her retirement, which she had already postponed to help with our caseload. 
Her service in this role was a fitting conclusion to her 27 years of distinguished service on the bench. Our two newest additions to the SJC, Justices Dalila Wenland and Serge George, have wasted no time in diving into the work of the court. Since I became Chief Justice, all of my colleagues have been a steadfast source of, of support and wise counsel for me as we've worked together to chart the future court course of the SJC and the court system. I'm so grateful to each of them. I'd also like to thank Governor Charlie Baker and the members of the Supreme Judicial Court Nominating Commission and the Governor's Council for their confidence and giving me the opportunity to lead the SJC and for choosing such talented and hardworking justices to join us on the court. I would also like to thank the governor and others in his administration for their collaboration with the courts on the eviction diversion initiative. The legislature also deserves our deepest thanks for its support during this difficult time. Our courts have been able to respond to the challenges of COVID-19 because our legislators have understood those challenges and given us the resources to meet them. I'm grateful to Senate President Karen Spilka, Speaker of the House Ron Mariano, and his predecessor, Robert DeLeo, and Ways and Means Committee Chair, Senator Michael Rodrick, Rodericks, and Representative Aaron Mikkelwitz for their leadership. And finally, but just as importantly, I wanna thank the bar associations and attorneys for your many contributions over the last year and a half. Attorneys have assisted the courts in dealing with COVID related challenges in so many ways through bar association activities, participation in court committees and providing pro, pro bono legal services to people affected by the pandemic. The MBA and Boston Bar Association produced materials on participating in remote court hearings. Attorneys working with the Access to Justice Commission's COVID-19 task force helped us publicize changes in court procedures, give feedback to the courts about the impact of those changes on court users, and recruit attorneys for pro bono projects. And many attorneys volunteered to provide pro bono legal services to those in need, such as small business owners and tenants and small landlords affected by the pandemic. What we have all been able to accomplish together has been nothing short of remarkable. Although there may be things that in re retrospect we might have done differently and better, that does not diminish the magnitude of our achievement in keeping the courts open and serving the public during the pandemic. We're not out of the woods yet, of course. The latest wave of COVID cases reminds us that we must continue to be vigilant. For that reason, the SJC has continued to require masks in courthouses under most circumstances. And as we go forward, we will continue to carefully monitor changes in COVID-19 conditions in the Commonwealth, recommendations by public health authorities, and what other state and federal courts are doing. Nevertheless, with rising vaccination rates and ebbing case counts, we can at least begin to foresee a return to normal court operations in the not too distant future. Now, however, we must face another task that in its own way is as difficult as those just completed. Envisioning what normal court operations will look like in the future and plotting a path to reach that goal. I doubt anyone believes that we should go back to exactly the way things were before the pandemic. And we expect to continue many of the advances that it brought about. We've learned, for example, that not all court events need to take place at the courthouse. We can save litigants and their lawyers considerable time and expense by holding some hearings virtually when appropriate. But we must recognize that, that not all litigants or their lawyers have access to the necessary technology or sufficient familiarity with it to participate effectively in virtual hearings. This is but one example of the dilemmas we will face in seeking to envision what normal court operations should look like in the future. We will need to sift through the many procedural and technological changes we've made in response to the pandemic and think carefully about whether to adopt them permanently, modify them in some way, or abandon them. And to undertake that review, we will need input, not only from judges and court staff, 
but from the attorneys who appear in our courts. The SJC and the trial court have been preparing a survey for members of the bar, which you should receive soon, soliciting your opinions. Please take the time to respond when you, when you receive it, for your answers will help to shape the future of our courts. As we emerge from the pandemic, we also need to do more to fight another kind of virus that has affected our legal system for far too long, the problem of racial and ethnic inequities. Even as we were battling COVID over the last year and a half, the repeated tragic and unjustified deaths of black men and women in police encounters across the country sparked a national re-examination of the role of race in our legal system. Here in Massachusetts, the long awaited Harvard Law School study on racial disparities in our criminal justice system that was released last fall concluded that black and Latinx people are overrepresented in the criminal caseload compared to their population in the state and that Black and Latinx people are given longer sentences than their similarly situated white counterparts. And another report issued by the Supreme Judicial Court Standing Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing last February called attention to how attorneys of color and from other historically excluded populations often experience differential treatment in our courts. Although issues of racial and ethnic inequities in our legal system are longstanding problems, these recent events and reports have reminded us that they are no less urgent than dealing with the pandemic. Left unchecked, they will undermine the fundamental principle of equal justice for all. Within the courts, we've made this issue a top priority. We have begun convening quarterly meetings of the chief justices of each court and the commissioner of probation to discuss what each court is currently doing and to share new proposals to combat racial and ethnic inequities. Chief Justice Carey will discuss the work that the trial court is doing in that area. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to again ask all of you for your input. If you have a suggestion as to how the courts can promote equity in our legal system more effectively, please feel free to reach out to my office. This is a complicated problem and we need everyone's best ideas. The last year and a half have presented a tremendous challenge for us all. Our courts have been sorely tested by unprecedented challenges. We have done our collective best to meet those challenges, albeit sometimes imperfectly. And now we have the opportunity to profit from what we've learned and to make our courts more efficient, more transparent, more responsive to the needs of court users and more equitable in treatment of all. Let us all join together to make the most of this extraordinary opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice Bud, for participating in today's program and for your remarks. I'd now like to introduce Chief Justice of the Trial Court, Paula Carey. Chief Justice Carey was a highly respected family law practitioner before becoming a probate and family court judge in 2001. She became the Chief Justice of the Probate and Family Court. And as a Chief Justice of the Probate and Family Court, she was instrumental in developing the Uniform Probate Code. She was appointed as Chief Justice of the Trial Court in 2013, and she was so effective that she was reappointed in 2018. As Chief Justice of the Trial Court, she oversees and manages Superior Courts, the BMC, the district courts, the housing courts, the juvenile court, the land court, the probate and family court, the office of commissioner of probation, and the office of the jury commissioner. As chief justice of the trial court, she has improved our court system. She's expanded the court service centers around the Commonwealth, and she's established programs to ensure access to justice. She's also been a partner with the MBA for many years. As a practitioner, she chaired the MBA's Family Law Section Council. And over the last several years, she's partnered with the Mass Bar Association on our Judicial Diversity Task Force. And in fact, she was a member of the task force and opened her office to us, inviting her staff, inviting Chief Justice Fabricant, developing programs with us. As you may be aware, earlier this month, Chief Justice Kerry announced that she will be retiring 
in a few months. To say that she will be missed would be an understatement. Chief Justice Kerry has been one of our most trusted partners in the courts for many, many years. I know I speak for everyone at the MBA when I say how grateful we are for both her leadership and her support of the MBA. Chief Justice Kerry, no matter where retirement takes you, know that you will always have a home and friends at the MBA. Every time the Mass Bar Association has asked her to participate in the program, she was there. So please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Paula Carey. Thank you, Attorney Bond. It's a bit different that we are recording our remarks for this year's State of the Judiciary instead of delivering them in person, but this should not surprise any of us given the last 19 months. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the legacy of Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. He was my chief, my friend, and my mentor. His passing was a loss to so many of us personally, but the loss to the system was immeasurable. Chief Justice Gantz had an innate capacity to listen and to listen well. He was strong, opinionated, and one of the most humble human beings I have ever known. He knew how to lift people up and inspire them in ways that only our most beloved leaders can do. He used his power to affect change and he did so in a way that is clear and authentic. The chief was not about self-promotion. He never did anything for the sake of receiving credit and in fact, typically gave credit to others. It's hard for me to accept the loss of Ralph Gantz. Since his death, I have often asked myself, what would he want? The answer is simple carry out my legacy. He would encourage all of us to confront systemic racism and to work to ensure that our system is fairer and more just. He would ask us to right wrongs and to listen to one another. He would say, as he did in his 2015 State of the Judiciary, in our courts, we seek to repair the world, sometimes even save the world one person at a time. What that means is that our courts will step up to the plate and seek to address the challenging problems that come before us. Another significant loss was that of Harry Spence, who was our system's first court administrator. His impact on the development of the court system and on me personally was immeasurable. Harry helped define the role of court administrator and left the trial court and the world a better place because he was in it. Last but certainly not least was the loss of Craig Burlingame, our recently retired CIO. While members of the bar may not have known Craig, his deep knowledge of state government and IT infrastructure was second to none. The state of the judiciary is one of the few opportunities during the year where we speak with members of the bar to discuss the issues that define our work. I'm grateful for the strong collaboration we have in Massachusetts between the judicial system, our co-equal branches of government and the members of the bar. My gratitude is especially strong given the support we've received as a system over the last couple of years. I will address five important issues today. First is how we have pivoted as a system since March of 2020, when the pandemic began. I'm incredibly proud of our system as we didn't miss a beat. We closed for two days in March and have been open and accessible to the public ever since. While our courthouses were physically open only for emergencies for a period of time, we remained available to all members of the public virtually for non-emergency matters. Second, I will address the awakening that has occurred in our system relative to racism and the disproportionate experience of marginalized communities in our justice system. The events of the last 19 months have rocked us in so many ways, including the need to face systemic racism directly and proactively. Third, I'll address the significant uptick in the behavioral health and substance use issues present in the people who appear before us and how we are working to adjust our system to address the needs of the 70% of the people who come to us with these issues, instead of the 30% who come to us without these acute needs. Fourth, I will update you on the efforts that the Massachusetts trial court has undertaken to implement the criminal justice reform legislation that was passed in 2018. And then lastly, I will speak about the Eviction Diversion Initiative, which has been a collaborative effort with the executive and legislative branch to prevent homelessness stemming from COVID-19. In early 2020, COVID-19 permanently changed our world. I never imagined having to live through the times that we've had to live through over the last 19 months 
or so, either personally or professionally. Who knew that I would learn so much about plexiglass, PPE, air, qual air quality, and MERV 13 filters. I thought my professional life was busy before COVID, but I would never have anticipated how much busier it would become. On many days, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders as I had to make difficult decisions to keep people safe. I'm confident that I'm not alone in saying that we all have undergone significant stress and uncertainty, not only due to the pandemic, but also due to the racial reckoning that we've all had to experience due to public events during the last year and a half. However, I believe that we have emerged stronger, more innovative and confident in our resilience as a result of these experiences. Over the course of the pandemic, everyone working for the trial court rose to the challenge and learned to be innovative to get the job done. Was it perfect? No. But much of what we learned about how we conduct business will inform how we will move forward. But for the pandemic, I suspect we would not have moved as fast as we have to advance electronic filing, electronic introduction of evidence, virtual registries, and so many other innovations. As of September 7th of 2021, we've resumed jury trials in all courts that held jury trials prior to the pandemic. We've done so with the health and safety of jurors, the public, and court staff foremost in our minds, with the help and guidance of the Jury Man Management Advisory Board and the Court Operations Committee. Out of adversity comes resilience. More than ever, we need to collectively work together to ensure that our system is the best that it can be. I thank the members of the bar who have contributed so much to this effort and to the stability of the court. I will now turn my attention to the systemic racism that is in many ways embedded into our system. As the Massachusetts trial court, we join the legal com community in recommitting to the systemic change needed to make equality under the law an enduring reality for all as urged by the seven justices of the Supreme Judicial Court. Dedicating resources to acknowledge and address race in the judicial system. It's not a new venture for the Massachusetts trial court, but we acknowledge that some of the efforts to date have not been enough to move the needle. The number of black employees and employees of color in the judicial and clerk magistrate ranks is insufficient. Our numbers are not where they should be. It is our obligation to hire and retain people of color in leadership roles and to do more to mentor our diverse talent and create pathways that enable them to move up in the organization. It is also essential that we identify, recruit and attract and develop lawyers of color to build the skills to obtain judicial or clerk magistrate appointments or other positions within our court system. As member, members of the trial court, we hold unique positions as leaders in the justice system. And we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because this work will not be easy. We must be more introspective about the fact that what we do and what we fail to do impacts the lives of others who have experienced the indignities of racism and injustice throughout their lives. We need to listen to the experiences of black and people of color as we work together to change our system. The time is now, and it will take all of our collective efforts to eradicate racism in our justice system. We must achieve racial equality and justice for all, especially for those most disserved by our nation's justice system for centuries. So what are we doing about it? As you know, we have a five-person Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Experience, affectionately called ODI. The office has been instrumental in facilitating discussions in communities of color to obtain input on experiences that they have with our system. ODI has developed experiential trainings geared toward impacting the views of court personnel, including judges in areas of bias, racism, cultural competence, and empathy. Our Office of Workplace Rights and Compliance is responsible for enforcing our discrimination, retaliation, and harassment policy. This policy applies to all persons who work in the trial court and those who interact with our system, including members of the bar and the public. In September of 2020, we received a report from the Criminal Justice Policy Program at Harvard Law School, which was commissioned by Chief Justice Gantz. We learned from that report that systemic racism exists in our criminal justice system at a variety of levels. We also received a report from the SJC Steering Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing, which described in a very powerful and painful way the experiences of individuals of our affinity bar. 
In many ways, both of these reports told us what we already knew or suspected, but they enabled us to better focus on the systemic aspect of the racism that exists in our justice system. These reports, as well as the community town halls and community forums on racism and racial reckoning over the last two years have further focused our efforts. Historically, the trial court has had multiple different groups, including judges, clerks, and security personnel, and others, addressing the issues of implicit bias and racism. In July of 2021, Court Administr Administrator Bayo and I commissioned the Committee to Eliminate Racism and Other Systemic Barriers in the Trial Court. This committee is charged, among other things, with advising me and Court Administrator Bayo regarding policies and initiatives to address institutional racism and systemic barriers based on race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, age, socioeconomic status, or other matters of identity that give rise to inequity among court users, judicial officers, or court personnel. The committee members are a cross-section of leaders in the trial court, and the committee has established working groups that are being populated with trial court colleagues at all levels, as well as external members of the bar and our justice partners. Along with my partner in justice, John Bayer, we are working with this committee and its working groups to address longstanding racial and systemic barriers so that all individuals are treated and believe they are treated by, the, by our system equitably. Behavioral health issues, namely substance use disorder and mental health conditions and trauma are present in many of the cases that come before our courts. We have recently implemented several large scale projects aimed at supporting criminal justice involved individuals who also have behavioral health needs and or they suffer from substance use disorder. At the end of 2020, the trial court received its largest ever federal grant, a $6 million award from the Department of Justice to expand court-based connections for individuals at risk of overdose in 12 local courts that serve 62 communities. The funding allows our courts to connect at-risk individuals to behavioral health treatment, sober housing, transportation services. Um, the project is called Project North, Navigation, Outreach, Recovery, Treatment, and Hope. It, it offers enhanced services in courthouses located in 12 communities highly impacted by overdose deaths. Those communities include Boston, Brockton, Fall River, Lawrence, Lowell, Lynn, New Bedford, Pittsfield, Quincy, Springfield, Taunton, and Worcester. Additionally, Project North provides court-based assistance to link court users to treatment and recovery support services, transportation to treatment, and court-mandated programming. Co co programming and up to six months of sober housing for 300 probation officer, uh, probationers over two years. Early this year, we launched the Boston Outpatient Assisted Treatment, the BO program, which is funded by a four-year grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The grant funds have enabled us to significantly expand services offered to people with serious mental health conditions who are justice involved and need more comprehensive intensive services than are currently available. In 1998, the Supreme Judicial Court developed standards on substance abuse to provide guidance to the courts on addressing substance abuse. We no longer use substance abuse, and that's one of the changes that needed to happen, and Chief Justice Gantz recognized that and that the standards needed to be updated. In the years since the standards were developed, the research and science on addiction, mental health, and trauma has grown tremendously. We now know that addiction is a chronic relapsing disease of the brain, which can be treated, and that without treatment is often fatal. We now know that mental health condition, uh, conditions and impacts of childhood and adult life trauma often co-occur with substance use disorders and trauma, which need to be treated. Individuals appearing in our court often present with not only substance use disorders and mental health conditions, but they're often poor. They have low educational attainment, housing instability, and food instability. The presence of these social determinants of health, in addition to substance use and mental health disorders, increase the complexity and the challenges of obtaining positive outcome. Both the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration 
recognize that the justice system is often society's first and many times only opportunity to identify and provide treatment for individuals with substance use disorders. As a result, judges are uniquely positioned to link these individuals to health professionals, evidence-based programs, mutual health groups, local specialty courts, and other related resources. We are committed to improving justice responses to individuals with behavioral health needs, including substance use disorders, mental health conditions, and consideration of the impact of trauma. Moving to criminal justice reform, in 2018, the Massachusetts legislature passed legislation representing the most significant changes to the state's criminal justice system in decades. Among many advancements, this legislation incentivizes good behavior in prison, diverts people to treatment and programming as an alternative to incarceration, and strengthens community response or community supervision. Over the past three years, we have implemented numerous provisions of the legislation, even during the, uh, the pandemic, including DNA collection by the Massachusetts Probation Service, reduction of fines and fees in criminal cases, adult criminal diversion, criminal code revisions, bail reform, pretrial uh, services modification, expansion of sealing and expungement, along with several initiatives in the juvenile court, including data transparency, diversion, elimination of notification to pro, uh, probation of overnight arrest, and also raising the minimum age uh, that applies to uh, individual, young, young people uh, in the juvenile court. In January 2016, Massachusetts embarked on a data-driven justice reinvestment approach to reducing, reoffending, containing con correction spending and investing in strategies to increase public safety. Towards that end, key stakeholders have worked to develop policies that will better align probation and parole supervision with best practices to reduce recidivism, to improve access to treatment for individuals in the criminal justice system who have serious behavior health needs, and are off, often at risk of uh, high risk for reoffending, and to make the parole release process more efficient in collaboration with probation, and to reduce DOC population and increase the number of people who receive post release supervision. COVID 19 has created tremendous housing and food insecurities across our nation. In August of 2020, shortly before his death, under the leadership of Chief Justice Scans and in collaboration with the executive and legislative branch of government, the eviction diversion initiative was established. From the trial court perspective, we made temporary changes to our eviction case processing to provide an opportunity for mediation on the first court date rather than having a summary process trial occur then. We also made changes to account for the various iterations of the orders issued by the Centers for G Disease Control and Prevention, and also to meet the requirements established by Chapter 257 of, by our mass uh, legislature. We launched Zoom waiting rooms to provide information to litigants while they wait for their case to be addressed. We also established Zoom rooms to expand access to virtual hearings for self-represented litigants who do not have access to a computer. We currently have three dashboards available that are updated each and every week to inform the public just exactly what's happening within our court system as to summary process cases and evictions issued by week and by county. In addition, we provide a monthly report on filings, actions, and dispositions entered in summary process, uh, process cases. As local communities work to address this crisis, state courts hold an important place in providing a comprehensive response built on key partnerships between the justice system and treatment, healthcare, and housing systems. I look forward to this state of the judiciary every year. Those of you who know me love, I know I'd love to talk about the trial court the judges, the clerks, and the incredible people who work so hard to make a difference every day. The people who make me proud to be a leader in this organization and to talk about my passion, the work of the delivery of justice. But the state of the judiciary also gives me the opportunity to acknowledge the great work by the bar and the many ways that you partner with us to help deliver justice with dignity. And it's only with all of you, the district attorneys, committee for public counsel, attorney general, the Mass Bar Association, Boston Bar Association, all the local and affinity bar association with your individual representation, the programs you sponsor, 
staff, and fund, and your advocacy for the trial court that we succeed. We share a background of legal education, training, and advocacy that allows us to do this important work. Please know that I never take the quality of representation or the goodwill of lawyers and the mass bar for granted. I'm profoundly grateful for the contributions uh, all of you make to the justice system each and every day. In closing, I'd like to thank Chief Justice Fudd and the Supreme Judicial Court Justices for their incredible support. My partner in justice, John Bayo, for his dedication and commitment to the trial court and for the knowledge and experiences he brings to us. And to my fellow Chief Justices and Deputy Court Administrators, judges, clerks, commissioners, and employees across the trial court who do just exemplary work each and every day. As many of you know, I recently announced that I will retire in January of 2022. I want to express my sincere gratitude for the support I received during this time. As I stated to the trial court community, I made this decision only after a great deal of thought and reflection because I had reached a point where I could no longer meet the needs of both my family and my trial court family without sacrificing my dedication to one. While this will be my last address as Chief Justice of the Trial Court, I want you all to know that I'm going to remain connected to the court and to justice systems, albeit in a different role, that will allow me to meet the needs of my family. I will continue to work towards racial equity and access to justice for all. Retirement for me is not an ending, but the beginning of a different life, committed to the same principles, just in a different way, that permits me to attend the imminent needs of my loved ones. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Kerry, for those remarks and for being here with us tonight. I'd now like to introduce Court Administrator of the Trial Court, John Bayo. As Trial Court Administrator, John Bayo oversees budget preparation, budget oversight, labor relations, IT, capital projects, and personnel policy. John Bayo comes from a long line of standout court administrators, including Harry Spence, John Williams. John Bayo continues in that tradition, but he's not new. He's been the associate court administrator since 2017. He worked in the court as director of facilities management and capital planning prior to that. And before that, he was a manager of facility services at Massport. John Bayo is committed to enhancing trial court services and improving access to justice. The MBA looks forward to working with John Bayo this year and doing just that. Please join me in welcoming John Bayo. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to address you for the first time as court administrator. I would like to begin my remarks by acknowledging the upcoming retirement of Chief Justice Carey. I am extremely honored to have worked with her since I began my career with a trial court. Over the past 18 months, we have worked very closely and there isn't a challenge to chase away from. Her incredible ability to lead from the bottom of her heart and the fact that she deeply cares about every single person in our system, in the justice system, is truly inspirational, and I am, I am a better person for that. She's an incredible leader who has dedicated her life to the work of the court system. I will deeply miss her, as will the entire system, but know I have a friend and a mentor in her. One of my longstanding guiding principles is that work done in collaboration yields better, better results. Across the entire justice system, collaboration and teamwork internally and externally help us all meet our mutual and essential goal of ensuring the delivery of justice. Since March, when I became core administrator, one of my key areas of focus has been to identify opportunities where we can collaborate with the bar and other partners to continue improving the system. Thanks to the enormous collaborations, collaboration and contributions by so many, we navigated the court system through the very difficult times created by the pandemic. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our judges, elected and appointed officials and their staff, the probation service, as well as those in the Office of Court Management and the Executive Office of the Trial Court. Our union partnership and collaboration also were key in our success. 
Everyone rose to the challenges presented to them and with innovation, hard work and resilience kept the wheels of justice turning. They inspire us by their teamwork and can-do attitude in serving the bark and the public. Whether working long hours from home or in courthouses, staff tackle issues made more complex by the pandemic. The continuity of service delivery is also a testament to the great working relationship with our many justice partners. And we thank the bar for your patience and understanding through these challenges. As Chief Justice Kerry often says, teamwork makes the dream work. It is hard work, but as a system, innovative, innovative ideas and thinking outside of the box, we kept the courts open throughout the pandemic. We made many operational adjustments and took a cautious approach, introducing policies and protocols to ensure the safety of all. Our security and facility staff implemented those safety measures daily under stressful circumstances. Out of every crisis, opportunities emerge, and we took full advantage of them. In fact, the pandemic accelerated many strategic initiatives outlined in Strategic Plan 3.0. A major focus of last year was finding ways to navigate the challenges the pandemic presented, but the fundamental work of the trial court never stopped. Now we continue to work just as hard to ensure that we continue building on the foundation of the great work the system did these past 19 months. The arrival of a new chief information officer accelerates the work of the department on several priorities. The support of the department during the pandemic was exemplary and work to secure our infrastructure and enhance our network reliability continues full steam ahead. A major technology focus continues to be the IT bond bill a critical priority for the trial court. This bond bill aims to create a seamless paperless court system while enhancing the services available to the public. Last January, we launched e-delivery, which will continue to grow to include case bodies and additional document types. Since launching this initiative, electronic delivery has grown to over 9,000 documents a week via email instead of traditional mail. E-filing options are also now available in six of the seven core departments. In addition, we're in the process of launching a comprehensive digital case flow planning to focus on identifying and establishing operational changes to achieve end-to-end -end digital case flow. This will create the roadmap for the upcoming IT bond bill as it relates to the transition to a paperless system. Chief Justice Kerry and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Executive Office of Technology Services and Security for their vote of confidence in jumpstarting the foundational work required by a digital court system. Other recent management improvements include the Human Resources Department's work to transform business processes to be more transparent and responsive. We now have a talent and acquisition team to recruit strong, diverse candidates a new applicant tracking system, and a diversity recruitment strategic plan in concert with our new Office of Workplace Rights and Compliance. Access to justice and the user experience have remained top priorities for the court system. And in 2021, Massachusetts was rated third in the nation by the Justice Index. During the pandemic, access to justice became even more urgent as it was clear from day one that the pandemic largely disadvantaged our largest cities and we needed to respond. As a result, virtual registries as well as virtual clerk's offices were created. Dedicated phone, phone and email addresses were created for every court and Zoom rooms were created within courthouses to help those without access to technology. Additionally, the Office of Language Access has provided interpreter services for more than 100,000 court events annually and interpreted it over 113 languages. Court service centers, centers provided services virtually to over 20,000 individuals during the pandemic. And we're happy to report that a virtual court service center will remain in place to expand the reach of our seven core base centers so that we can assist individuals statewide. In 2019, 
we establish a trauma-informed task force to develop a system-wide program. But the pandemic, racial reckoning across the nation, and the sudden death of Chief Justice Gans put the task force to the test. As part of the task force, we hire a vendor to provide one-on-one -on -one clinician-led non-therapeutic support for jurors post-vetted who may be struggling due to exposures associated with their juror services. I'm pleased to announce that in partnership with the Institute for Health and Recovery, we will begin a pilot at Lawrence District Court to begin exploring ways to make that division a trauma-informed court. The results of this pilot program will guide our efforts to create a trauma-informed court system that involves our partners in justice. In probation, work is underway to implement a new case management system. Probation's unique information management and data sharing needs are driving factors behind this major project. The Victim Service Unit has served nearly 4,000 victims and families this past year, which is essential to probation's mission. The Criminal Justice Reform Act of 2018 established comprehensive pretrial service, uh, services as a top priority for the Massachusetts Trial Court and the Massachusetts Probation Service, which are committed to consistent, effective, and comprehensive pretrial supervision and services. Last November, a test reminder system was launched to reduce the number of probationers who failed to appear for hearings. This program showed early success and has expanded to other court departments. Chief Justice Kerry early, earlier discussed the various ways the trial court is actively working to eliminate racism and other barriers. As a person of color, this issue is very important to me and I trust we will continue to make real progress. Our courts must represent the communities we serve and our commitment stand, stands to the hiring and promotion process. Representation matters. There is a lot of work to be done, but, a, but as Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. I am confident that we are on the right track, but must remain patient as we tackle these very challenging and complex issues. Finally, as we wind down work on Strategic Plan 3.0, we are already starting to develop the NEST plan to guide the next three years. As in the past, we will engage the broader justice community to make sure we get it right. We must listen to our judges, appointed and elected officials and staff. We must listen to our partners in justice and we must listen to court users to make sure we get it right. Only with genuine and ongoing collaboration with the bar on the many initiatives I have highlighted can we succeed in our mutual goal to effectively deliver justice. This has been an unprecedented and uncertain time for all of us with more uncertainty ahead. And I thank you sincerely for your continued partnership and support. Thank you. Once again, we'd like to thank Chief Justice Budd, Chief Justice Carey, and Court Administrator John Bayo for speaking with us this evening. They inspire us all with their leadership and we are thankful for their support of the Massachusetts Bar Association. And finally, thank you all for attending this evening and have a good evening.